Hello again, everyone. It's Carl. Today I have a chilling tale to share about a young girl's fateful summer vacation. In 2013, the vibrant and ebullient Daniela Locklear celebrated her 15th birthday with excitement and youthful optimism. She looked forward to spending her summer with her beloved grandparents in the small town of Hope Mills, North Carolina. There, days were carefree. She worked for a time at a summer camp and attended church events with her family. During her stay, Daniela immersed herself in this new community. She made new acquaintances and was struck by one boy in particular, 17-year-old Jamichael Malloy. They met at church, where he seemed gentle and respectable. Observant family remarked how Daniela beamed when in his company. As summer drew to a close, Daniela was reluctant to leave both Jamichael and the familiarity she'd found. In a bid to remain, she persuaded her mother to transfer her to the local high school and live permanently with her grandparents. The whole family supported this scheme, unaware of the darkness that would soon engulf their once idyllic vacation spot. Daniela started her freshman year of high school with promise, excelling in nearly every subject. However, by the end of the fall semester, difficulties had arisen in her relationship with her boyfriend, Jamichael. Just before the new year, they decided to part ways, though a week later realized they couldn't stay apart and reconciled once more. Over the coming months, their union would dissolve and reform repeatedly. By early March, Daniela's family noticed a shift in her demeanor, growing withdrawn and isolated. She often shut herself away in her bedroom, communicating less with relatives at home. They understood the tumultuous bond with Jamichael lay at the heart of her suffering. Despite efforts to keep busy with friends and switch off her worries, Daniela's loved ones hoped in time she might forget Jamichael and find peace. Alas, they would be grievously mistaken. On the evening of March 11th, Daniela informed her grandfather a classmate required assistance with a textbook next door. He granted permission for the brief errand but requested a swift return. Around 10 p.m., Daniela departed as her grandfather launched a new video game inside, unaware. At that moment, Daniela's grandmother arrived at the family home. She inquired about Daniela, and upon learning that she had gone to her friends, called her, but there was no answer. Relatives reached out to close friends, but no one knew the whereabouts of their granddaughter. On the morning of March 12th, the family contacted the police, reporting Daniela missing. The police, in an affirmative tone, suggested she likely ran away from home, a common occurrence at her age. However, Daniela's family didn't entertain that possibility. They were convinced that something unfortunate had happened. Taking matters into their own hands, the family initiated searches and created Facebook groups to spread the word about Daniela's disappearance. Investigators swiftly identified the gathering spots for local youth in the small town of Hope Mills, with a population of only 15,000, and interviewed friends of the missing girl. They soon discovered that on the evening Daniela disappeared, she went to a local stream where her friends often gathered. The police spoke to Daniela's friend, who according to Daniela's grandfather, went out in the evening to return a textbook. The friend revealed that they spent the day of March 11th by the stream, even showing pictures taken at that time. However, Daniela did not come to her later that evening. Daniela's aunt, familiar with the stream where young people met, decided to check the area the next day. She arrived at the stream, walked along the paths, and in one spot found the word HELP written in the mud. While she found nothing suspicious nearby, when she ventured off the path and searched through the grass, she discovered one of Daniela's socks. She had personally given these socks to her niece, who used to wear them before bedtime. After finding the sock, the police began to suspect that Daniela's disappearance might be the result of something more sinister than a mere runaway. They started looking into who Daniela had met that evening. Soon, they learned about her troubled relationship with her ex-boyfriend, Jamichael. Investigators immediately theorized that she spent that evening with him. When the police located and questioned Jamichael, he stated that he hadn't spoken to Daniela for several days before her disappearance. The guy reported that the girl took their breakup badly, but he no longer wanted to spend his time meeting with her. Jamichael admitted that he was tired of Daniela's constant calls and messages, so he even blocked her phone number. Jamichael revealed that Daniela was depressed, and she had attempted suicide twice. He shared that, after their breakup, she once threatened to drown herself in cold water. The guy stated that on the evening of March 11th, he was at home with his friend. His 18-year-old friend and Jamichael's family confirmed that he was at home with them that evening and night. The police asked the guy to check his phone, 
he agreed and willingly provided his mobile. Investigators found that Daniela had recently informed Jamichael in messages that she was pregnant. In response to this news, he sent angry messages to her, expressing disbelief. The next day, he wrote that he was very angry and didn't want to see her. Messages between Jamichael and Daniela clearly indicated that their relationship was not amicable, but there was no direct link between the guy and his ex-girlfriend's disappearance. Data from Jamichael's mobile phone showed that he was indeed at home that evening and night, even exchanging messages with other girls. The search for Daniela continued, and Jamichael decided to assist the police, joining the search efforts. He helped volunteers, distributed flyers, and became part of a Facebook group dedicated to finding the missing girl. The police reviewed surveillance camera footage, studied signals from Daniela's mobile phone on the evening she disappeared, confirming that she left her home around 10 in the evening. The last calls from her phone occurred almost an hour later, around 10.40 p.m. Investigators went to the area near the tower where Daniela made the call, hoping to find at least her phone, but the searches yielded nothing. Investigators continued questioning friends and attempted to locate individuals Daniela might have interacted with that evening. They knew she was at the stream with a friend during the day, but they were unaware of other friends who were also there. In a photo of Daniela at the stream, she was wearing glasses, and reflections in the glasses showed other people. One of them turned out to be another friend, and she was located and interviewed. She told the police that on that day, Daniela was upset about her breakup with her boyfriend Jamichael. When asked with whom else she might have spent that evening, the friend shrugged and said she didn't know. Local investigators realized they needed additional help in the search, and eventually, the FBI became involved in Daniela's case. Unfortunately, their efforts did not help locate Daniela. Then, 23 days after Daniela's disappearance on April 2, 2014, one of the on-duty police officers on the bridge near the South River noticed something unusual in the water and reported it to the authorities. When police officers went to check the strange object in the river, they discovered it was the body of a young girl. Her relatives identified her, and the deceased turned out to be Daniela Locklear. A yellow rope with a heavy concrete block attached to her waist and ankles was found. Later, during the autopsy, forensic experts found a sock deep in the girl's throat, matching the one her aunt had found by the stream. It became clear that someone had intentionally tormented her. The autopsy revealed that Daniela died from asphyxiation, possibly aided by the sock, and she was not pregnant at the time of her death. She was found approximately 30 kilometers from her grandmother's house, and only about one and a half kilometers from the house where her ex-boyfriend, Jamichael Malloy, lived. Investigators believed they needed to revisit this guy. The police obtained a search warrant for his home, where they found concrete blocks and nylon rope identical to those tied to Daniela's body. Soon after, the police found her cell phone lying in the grass, near the road between the discovery site and Jamichael's home. In the phone, and threatening voicemail left by her ex-boyfriend was discovered. In it, he stated that if she left him, he would kill her. None of her close ones believed Jamichael capable of such brutality. Friends described him as a quiet, introverted guy who worked part-time and planned to become a Marine. Jamichael Malloy was summoned again for questioning. He continued to deny involvement in his ex-girlfriend's death, and he was released. Later, investigators questioned his friend Dominic, but this time, he refused to talk to the police. A few days passed. On April 9th, Jamichael voluntarily came to the police station and confessed to everything. He recounted the events of the day the tragedy occurred. On the evening of March 11th, Jamichael, along with Dominic, went to Daniela's house. They threw a wallet at her window to get her attention. A few minutes later, Daniela told her grandfather that she needed to go to her friend. But in reality, she went out to the guys and the three of them went to the stream. Once there, Daniela again informed Jamichael that she was pregnant. Dominic, positioned 50 meters away from the couple, didn't interfere with their relationship issues. An argument ensued, and Jamichael demanded that she take a pregnancy test right then and there. The girl refused. Following this, Jamichael stated that if the test results were positive, he would support her. But there would never be any romantic relationship between them in the future. After these words, Daniela lunged at him. She struck him, triggering the young man's rage. He grabbed the girl and began choking her. He was unaware of the gravity of his actions. In a moment of realization, he abruptly released her, 
and she collapsed face down on the ground, motionless. Understanding the gravity of what had happened, Jamichael ran to his car and informed his friend of the tragedy. He asked Dominic to help him dispose of the body. Together they carried Daniela to the car and placed her in the trunk. As they drove to Jamichael's home, they heard noises from the trunk. It turned out that the girl was making strange sounds from her mouth. Dominic removed her sock from her feet and shoved it deep into her mouth. Upon reaching Jamichael's home, he and his friend took a concrete block from the garage, tied it to Daniela, and then drove to the nearest river, where they disposed of the body. Dominic fully corroborated Jamichael's account and added that he was shocked when his friend confessed to killing Daniela, threatening that they both would go to prison for murder if he didn't help dispose of the body. The police questioned why the mobile phone records showed Jamichael was at home on the night of the murder. He admitted to using a special app to create an alibi. In reality, he left his phone at home, and the app automatically sent messages to other girls. Jamichael and Dominic were subsequently charged with second-degree murder in connection with Daniela Locklear's death. Initially dissatisfied with the second-degree charges, the family wanted the guy to be charged with first-degree murder, believing Jamichael had planned to harm Daniela. However, the family eventually agreed to a plea deal. Jamichael's mother never believed her son was capable of such brutality, stating he had never been in trouble, fought, vandalized, or stolen. The defendants pleaded guilty. In May 2016, Jamichael Malloy was sentenced to 25 to 31 years in prison. His friend Dominic received a sentence of six to eight years. Jamichael Malloy expressed his apologies to the Locklear family and admitted he couldn't turn back time. Thank you for watching this video. Subscribe, rate, leave comments, and please take care of yourselves. The lifeless remains of a teen girl were uncovered in a landfill just outside town. Her loved ones immediately suspected the man who had stalked her for years, and later he openly wept at her memorial service. Marbella Valdez entered this world in 1999 in Tijuana, Mexico, and faced immense hardship from the start. Her birth parents left her to fend for herself, and she bounced between various foster families as a child. At the shelter, she formed an unbreakable bond with Brenda, an older girl who became the sister she never had. At age 16, destiny brought Marbella under the care of William Messick, who directed a local orphanage. Though he never made her adoption official, Marbella saw him as her father, and he treated her with paternal affection. He was married with kids of his own, and Marbella excelled in her studies, eventually enrolling in law school to advocate for abused and neglected women. She balanced work at the gas station to finance her studies, as well as board in a flat nearer to campus, aided by William, who footed her lease. Outside the university, Marbella lent her vocals to the parish choir, though her schedule was almost always full. However, on the 5th of February, she failed to clock in for her 6 a.m. shift. When her colleague rang, Marbella reported feeling under the weather and hastily hung up, her tone fearful. At 9 a.m., a text from Marbella reached Brenda, citing illness and plans to visit the doctor, but repeated calls went unanswered. Concerned for her well-being, Brenda rallied another friend and they traveled to Marbella's home, finding the entrance locked fast with no reply forthcoming. They spied an ajar window and climbed inside, but she was nowhere to be found. Brenda informed William straight away, and together they commenced a search for Marbella, who had also neglected to appear at the hospital. A troubled call from her co-worker only amplified anxiety regarding her disappearance. Neither medical centers nor the college could offer any information on Marbella's whereabouts. Brenda likewise contacted their numerous mutual acquaintances, yet none knew of her location or condition. Marbella left home early that morning, but failed to reach her destination or contact her family. Concern grew as the day wore on with no news of the missing girl. That evening, her family reported her disappearance to the local authorities and asked for volunteers to help with the investigation. The police investigation began, checking Marbella's usual routines and interviewing everyone who knew her in the hope of finding clues to her whereabouts. Her boyfriend Juan, like everyone else, was puzzled by her absence. A search of Marbella's apartment found it undisturbed, with no sign of a hasty departure. Days passed without resolution, 
Hospitals had no record of Marbella arriving for medical treatment. Repeated attempts to ping her mobile phone proved fruitless, shielding any means of geolocating the device. Investigators postulated that her disappearance occurred sometime after dawn, but before the workday began in earnest. On the third day after her disappearance, a member of the community scouring the landfill noticed an unusually large black package. Curiosity drew them closer, and they alerted the police when they realized the inexplicable presence of the bag. Officers arrived promptly and opened the container to find Marbella's bound and lifeless form, dressed in sleeping clothes. Bright red curls and orthodontic appliances matched known details of the missing girl. Forensic experts determined that the battered body was indeed that of 20-year-old Marbella Valdez. Her abdomen was covered in bruises from violent blows, she was bleeding internally, and suffocation was the cause of death. Particles and DNA of her killer were found under her fingernails. Male bodily fluids were taken for analysis. Detectives investigated Marbella's murder intensively, meticulously searching her flat and car for clues. They discovered tracking devices planted in the car's intricate mechanisms. Investigators re-interviewed intimates to identify any suspicious figures fixated on her, perhaps stalking her movements. According to William Messick, from the summer of 2019, a lover gave her affectionate gifts of flowers, candy, and stuffed animals. The gifts filled her home, although the giver remained a secret, as revealing them would incur the disapproval of William Messick. Friends disclosed that Marbella was pursued by Juan, a 36-year-old man who frequented her gas station solely to admire her from afar. They crossed paths when he stopped to fuel his vehicle and was instantly charmed by her exquisite beauty and cheerful demeanor. Juan became a devoted customer, only making purchases on shifts when he knew Marbella would be working the pumps. In the mornings, he brought croissants and coffee for Marbella, as well as her co-workers, showing care through modest gestures without forward flirtation. He acted as an ally, yet gradually began lavishing her with small gifts. Despite Marbella maintaining a respectful distance and not reciprocating his feelings, she found solace in the compliments and attention lavished upon her by the kind-hearted Juan. Marbella enjoyed her new job and colleagues, finding purpose and camaraderie among them. However, one man, Juan, pursued her affection insistently. Though married with children, he professed deep feelings for Marbella and asked for her hand. She declined gently, seeking stability rather than complication. But Juan wouldn't relent, appearing wherever she went, as if tracking her movements. Perplexed, as they knew each other only through work, Marbella began to feel uneasy. Her boyfriend later received threats should he remain by Marbella's side. Concerned friends urged her to petition for distance from Juan legally. Yet Marbella saw goodness in him and hoped this strange behavior would pass. Police focused their search on Juan, suspecting him of increasing threats. On Valentine's Day, Marbella Memorial was held as investigations continued. There, Juan arrived grief-stricken with flowers and scrawled skin, distressing loved ones with fresh wounds. Questions outweighed answers as the case unfolded. By this time, Marbella's nearest and dearest were well aware that the long arm of the law had their eye on him as a person of interest, finding him less than pleasant to be around. However, they were careful to keep such suspicions to themselves so as not to potentially obstruct the official inquiry or cause him to make himself scarce before being brought in for questioning. When the authorities secured the necessary warrant, a thorough search of Juan's premises turned up some items of a disturbing nature, namely a full police uniform, including cap and regulation footwear stashed away in his place of residence. Juan's past was more complex than initially appeared. Though once serving dutifully as an intern and officer, Desires emerged pulling him towards deception. He retained his uniform, using it to mimic authority and mask malintent. Within his home's walls, secrets were uncovered. Two phones and tracking apps pinpointing Marbella's location, both before her disappearance and after. Computers too held clues, messages read without consent, and activities pursued prohibited by law. Detectives pieced together a disturbing chain of events. Juan had been keeping watch through devices and profiles, learning her patterns, 
On that fateful night, his presence was noted for lengthy hours within her home. Then in darkness, three phones moved in tandem, two belonging to the suspect and one to the missing woman. Her belonging was later found alongside her body in a remote area, the phone's trail ending there. Deductions led police to believe Juan had waited until she slept, exploiting a spare key to stealthily enter and take her against her will. The desperate man found his life spiraling out of control. In a moment of weakness and poor judgment, he took Marbella to his ramshackle abode, where he inflicted unspeakable harm upon her fragile form. Overcome by rage and sorrow, his hands found purchase around her delicate neck as blackness clouded his vision. When clarity returned, only horror and remorse remained. Feebly, he dragged her lifeless body to the outskirts of town and concealed it amongst the refuse, hoping against hope that his heinous act might somehow be erased. Unfortunately for the distraught man, true evil leaves traces that cannot be removed. His DNA was swiftly matched to samples retrieved from her broken nails and torn flesh, sealing his gruesome fate. Despite proclamations of innocence, the mountains of evidence spoke only of unimaginable cruelty. Now, as the judicial process crawls forward amid ongoing health risks, 50 years of solitude seem to be his just deserts for extinguishing so bright a light. Though the punishment is rightly severe, only time will tell if any leniency remains for one overcome by such shadows of the soul. Marbella's friend Brenda felt immense rage towards the police force. It came to light that on the fateful day Marbella vanished without a trace, Brenda had divulged to detectives Juan's unsettling stalking behavior, yet they dismissed her concerns without consideration. Brenda holds the police responsible for not promptly inspecting Juan's home. If they had investigated his residence shortly after her disclosure, there was a chance they could have found Marbella still alive and rescued her from whatever sinister fate had befallen her. Another of Marbella's close companions, an elder law student also recently recalled a disturbing conversation she had with Marbella just before she disappeared without explanation. Marbella was anxious to meet up on that ill-fated day to discuss women's rights legislation and seek the companion's sage legal counsel, showing she recognized she required aid to protect herself, but sadly assistance came too late. Marbella became the 17th female murdered in Mexico throughout 2020 marking yet another life taken far too soon. According to data, 940 women lost their lives last year alone in the volatile nation. To honor Marbella and all those whose lives were stolen through violence, a poignant portrait was painted upon a wall to represent the nameless faces of victims. William Messick took action amidst the tragedy, offering self-defense lessons free of charge to empower women to protect themselves. As a martial arts master, he personally instructed courses to spread knowledge and provide a sense of safety. I will diligently follow updates from the trial, committed to sharing the outcome far and wide. If this video resonated and you wish to engage further on the crucial issues highlighted, please interact through likes, subscribe and comment below. Thank you for your time and attention to this important discussion. To solve one horrifying case, 25 years were not enough. The beautiful 19-year-old student of an American university disappeared without a trace after a party. There was a suspect from the first day, but it proved virtually impossible to bring him to book. Decades later, the host of one podcast told the sinister story again, this time to millions of people, with the police reopening the investigation at the behest of its listeners. Kristen Smart was born in the city of Augsburg in Germany on February 20th, 1977. At an early age, she moved with her parents, her brother and her sister to the United States. The family settled in the sunny town of Stockton. Her parents found a job there as teachers also of the children of American servicemen. Kristen graduated from Lincoln High School. In 1996, she began her studies at the California Polytechnic State University. She worked as a lifeguard at the campus recreation center in her free time. One of the fraternity houses organized a party on May 25th that year. The party was held to celebrate the birthday of a member of the fraternity. Kristen wanted to be there, 
but none of her friends wanted to join her. The partygoers drank alcohol, listened to music, and celebrated as is traditional at such campus events. The student had also drunk quite a bit by the time they were getting ready to go back to their dorm in the early morning hours. Before they got there, the liquor caught up with her. She felt unwell at some time after 2 a.m., threw up and then admitted that she was too drunk to walk. Two students who had also been at the party saw her stumbling on the street. They said they would accompany her back to the dorm. At the end of the meeting, another man appeared. His name was Paul Flores. Paul told the other two not to worry, as he'd take Kristen back to her dorm on his own. He lived near her, he added. Kristen Smart was never seen again. At first, nobody noticed her absence, not even Kristen's roommate, Margarita. She thought Kristen had headed back to her room in the early hours after the fraternity party. When her friend failed to show up the following morning, Margarita thought the worst. Her disappearance was confirmed when all her personal items, passport, purse, bank card, were still in the room. Kristen never went anywhere without those things. Margarita spoke to campus police 48 hours after Kristen was last seen. The campus police didn't seem particularly concerned. It was a holiday weekend they were marking Memorial Day, which honors the fallen men and women of the U.S. Armed Forces. The local force suggested Kristen may have just gone home to her parents for the holiday. The fact that she'd left all her important documents and belongings behind seemed irrelevant. More to the point, the Smart family's home was a seven-hour drive from Kristen's college. It seemed unlikely that she'd have taken a spontaneous trip there in the dead of night. By that string, campus police decided to rouse themselves. They called Kristen's home. Her mother said that no, her daughter hadn't just been to see them, and actually, she hadn't been in touch these last few days. They connected her to her husband, and the pair contested this at the local police headquarters. All the same, the latter did not seem ready to open a file on Kristen's mysterious disappearance. The local force pointed out that not much time had passed and she may have run off somewhere with her friends. The search for Kristen Smart only began on the fourth day of her going missing. At first, volunteers led the search, but they uncovered nothing. Law enforcement eventually came around to Paul Flores, the guy who had volunteered to walk Kristen back to her dorm. He was probably the last person to see her alive. Flores told detectives that he walked with her to her dorm, said goodnight, and walked back to his place alone. He said he went straight to bed. His story began to unravel almost immediately. His dorm neighbors said they watched him head to the shower around 5 a.m., but his story was that he had parted ways with Kristen closer to two. He also had a shiner under his eye and scrapes on his knees. Why? Ask three different people, and you'd get three different stories. Flores was a bad look, but not exactly solid evidence. Nearly a month after Kristen's disappearance, the search for her escalated to her hometown. Things were getting out of hand in local media. They likened her case to a storyline in the newly canceled Twin Peaks and threw in some fake psychics who claimed to have already cracked the case. According to them, a pair of men killed Kristen on campus, then hauled her body to a cliff and threw it in a body of water. Right, a year after Kristen disappeared, her parents filed a wrongful death suit against Paul Flores. In 1997, he took the stand, stating his name and answering just one more question after that. The rest of the time, he took the fifth, as in, he claimed the Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself. Paul's parents countersued Kristen's family on the grounds that the lawsuit was causing them emotional distress. Neither suit went anywhere. Paul Flores could not be arrested due to a lack of evidence. On May 25, 2002, the sixth anniversary of Kristen's disappearance, she was finally declared dead. Around that time, Scott Peterson's name began flying around the media as a potential suspect. Peterson was already the main suspect in the disappearance of a different woman. However, his connection to the case was merely his presence at the university around the time Kristen went missing. The police quickly ruled him out. Another 16 years went by with no forward movement on the case. In 2018, Chris Lambert, a California resident, was creating a podcast on various crimes. At eight years old, he remembered the news story of Kristen's disappearance in 1996. 22 years later, he decided to do a little extra digging and was appalled by the apathy of the police. 
he went to all the witnesses himself first. The witnesses who were students at the university told him that Paul Flores had a reputation for frequently hitting on girls without reciprocation, although no formal complaints had been filed against him. Next, Chris took a microscope to the detective's work and he dislodged an egregious mistake. Detectives in question didn't go to Flores' house until two months after Kristen's disappearance, and considering Paul lived with his parents, the detective should have been researching his background talking to the parents. The search was done so bad when it finally happened. The detectives didn't bring any forensic experts or dogs trained to recognize the scent of a corpse, both of which would have made the search effective. They also didn't go through two cars owned by the Flores family, one of which Paul could have put Kristen's body in at the university and driven to his father's house. Both cars reportedly smelled of rotting eggs, the smell of a corpse, but a few months after the police came, one of the cars was sold and the other was apparently stolen. The police never made a search of Paul's mother's home, where a golden lead was hiding under their noses the entire time. Mary Lassiter, a dog groomer, had rented this home four months after Kristen went missing. A further two months after that, she was cleaning one of the rooms when she discovered an earring remarkably similar to one Kristen had been wearing on the night she went missing. Moreover, in a photograph that circled the campus around the time of Kristen's disappearance, those same earrings can be seen. Mary stumbled upon this coincidence, and she reported her discovery to the police. What's interesting, is that they actually didn't want Todd take the earring into evidence in the beginning, and they lost it later. But the next, what Chris found out was actually quite shocking. You see, the backyard of Paul's mother's house was always covered with concrete. But shortly after Kristen disappeared, a section of the concrete was removed and a flower bed appeared. Mary Lassiter, who rented that house, said some pretty chilling things to Chris. She heard an electronic beeping, similar to that of a wristwatch alarm, every day, around 4 a.m. and 4 p.m., coming from that very flower bed for quite some time. The beeping stopped one day, either because the battery died, or perhaps the watch was dug up and relocated. This is a story that Chris Lambert brought to Kristen's mother. Upon hearing about the beeping, she was stunned and was unable to speak for some time. She then revealed that her daughter always set a beeper in the mornings at 4 a.m. since she had to work at 5 a.m. at the local rec center. More than six million people listened to Chris Lambert's podcast when it was released in 2019. Six million people who couldn't believe that the police could respond and do nothing, allowing a killer to live among you all these years. The outrage over Chris's new leads were enough to persuade the police department to finally reopen the case and this time, they did their job properly over 20 years later. A thorough search was executed at four locations, which included Paul Flores' home. At first, they announced they'd found evidence of interest to the investigation. On January 29, 2020, police declared that they'd impounded two of Paul's automobiles for potential evidence. Eventually, they excavated the same flower bed in Paul's mother's yard and still did not find Kristen Smart's remains though law enforcement noted they discovered traces of human decomposition. On February 11th, 2021, Paul Flores was finally arrested, albeit not for Kristen's murder, but for illegal possession of a concealed weapon that wasn't registered. Fast forward to March 15th, a judge signed off on a search warrant for the home of Paul's father, Ruben Flores. And the moment everyone had been waiting for arrived on April 13th. They were arrested in connection with her disappearance, with Paul being charged for her murder and Reuben for being an accessory. In the end, that party, the one where Paul had the girl all to himself, they were classmates, willing to bet as he tried to make a move and presumably Kristen rebuffing him. An altercation over this would explain the deep scratch on his cheek and the black eye Paul was nursing at the time. Presumably he killed her her body driven by him to his house. Him with his father likely buried it in the backyard and concealed it under the flower bed. In time, they could have dug the remains up, placing them in some location unknown for safekeeping from the discovery Paul nor his father feared law enforcement would make. In September 2021, the trial began 
they didn't plead guilty, which extended the legal process. The idea that they could avoid punishment so far along in a case with this much evidence seemed implausible, however. April 25, 2022 was supposed to be the next phase of the trial. The case was moved to a different jurisdiction in response to a request from Flores's lawyers on the advice of his attorneys on March 30, 2022. A jury was seated from over 1,500 possible candidates over the summer. Opening arguments and motions from the prosecution and defense took place. The jury came back with a verdict on October 17, 2023. Paul Flores was found guilty of first-degree murder. He could be sentenced from between 25 years and life in prison. The younger Flores father, if you recall, is believed to have helped bury the body and then moved the remains, though his guilt hasn't been proven. The district attorney insisted it wasn't the end. The search for Smart's remains will continue, the prosecutor insisted. Kristen Smart's parents gave a public thank you to Chris Lambert and everyone who cared. The podcast and Chris's digging into the story did an amazing job at ending the case and bringing the killers in it to justice. It just so happens that Smart's disappearance also instigated the state of California, passing the Kristen Smart Campus Safety Act which requires California's state colleges and publicly funded educational institutions to enter into memorandums of understanding with the law enforcement agencies relative to missing students and student violence. As always, share your thoughts on the verdict in the comments. Subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. Mary Collins was a sweet girl born on a summer day in Charlotte, North Carolina. According to those closest to her, whether it be family like her loving Aunt Kara Williams or educators such as elementary school director Carolyn Hoare, Mary possessed a gentle, light, and kind soul that could warm even the coldest of hearts with her tender embrace. While afflicted at birth with the rare genetic disorder DeGeorge syndrome caused by a missing fragment on chromosome 22, she never let her challenges diminish her bright and cheerful spirit. Despite the potential issues related to speech, behavior, and heart complications associated with her condition, Mary found joy through her passion for art and music, often strumming melodies on her guitar to spread happiness. While not as widely known as Down syndrome, DeGeorge syndrome remains the second most common genetic disorder, although Mary never saw herself as limited and brought delight to all with her charming presence. Though her time was brief, Mary Collins's gracious nature left an indelible mark and lasting smile on all who had the blessing of knowing her compassionate soul. Mary faced many adversities early in life due to being born with a cleft palate. This caused severe impediments to her speech, which made social interactions difficult. She was incredibly shy, speaking only to those closest to her. In addition to these speech issues, Mary had poor eyesight requiring thick glasses. Her studies were an ongoing struggle, and performing daily tasks felt nearly impossible. Simply navigating her own neighborhood streets proved too challenging as she easily lost her way. Driving was out of the question, and her trusting nature left her vulnerable to manipulation. Despite facing barriers beyond her years, Mary refused to be defined by her limitations. With determination, she strived for independence instead of relying on family. A GPS device accompanied her on walks to assist with wayfinding. Her condition did not dampen her optimistic spirit. Like any girl her age, Mary enjoyed experimenting with fashion and beauty. She found the good in everyone, sometimes overlooking faults that could potentially endanger her kindness. Tragically, her trusting nature made her a target for those who would exploit her goodwill for their own gain. On a rainy Saturday evening in late March, young Mary found herself accepted into the company of her former school acquaintances, Kelly and Levi. At their invitation, Mary caught a taxi to their shared flat, hoping for reconciliation after months of hurtful exchanges online. Though relatives warned of past unkindness, Mary wished to revive what was lost. After exchanging laughs as seen in Mary's last posted video, the three spent hours reminiscing within the apartment's walls. Mary's family assumed the worst of the pandemic had distracted their worries, believing her phone's lost signal meant relaxing safely with friends. Yet as days passed in growing isolation, Mary's loved ones sensed something was amiss. Checking her phone records showed no activity since arriving at the flat. A report to authorities began the search for Mary, whose last known whereabouts placed her within the home of those she hoped called friend once more. Her grandmother departed to that peculiar dwelling, hoping to locate Mary and escort her safely home. 
but gaining entry proved quite formidable. Strict security measures were enforced and cameras were postered everywhere one gazed. The grandmother patiently waited until finally a resident emerged, and she discreetly followed inside. Upon inspecting the post boxes, her eyes glimpsed Mary's friend's moniker, alongside a figure, guiding her there. A knock summoned Kelly and Levi, who promptly opened the door, professing Mary had abandoned several hours prior. In that instant, the grandmother's worries mounted tremendously. She understood something wasn't accurate, because she knew Mary often stumbled when solo in unfamiliar places. Lost is how she'd become. The grandmother speculated they must have quarreled like so many times beforehand. On the 30th of March, two sunsets after her disappearance, the grandmother alerted the authorities. The police reluctantly took the case, but in their opinion, Mary had reached an age where she could independently decide where and with whom to spend her time. They believed she'd return once finished visiting other acquaintances. Later that evening, the law enforcement officials visited Kelly's living quarters, but no one opened the door. The police personnel simply exited the scene. Mary's loved ones felt strongly that she was still inside those four walls. Her unknown situation greatly unsettled them, as the final records of cellular phone activity were traced back there. Mary's kinsmen pleaded desperately with the police force to take this dilemma far more seriously and conduct a thorough inspection of the premises. However, the officers took no measures, failing to even review the video surveillance archives of the residential complex to validate if Mary had truly departed from there. Exasperated, Mary's family elected to take matters into their own hands. Unable to access the surveillance video files, they decided to rotate shifts, keeping a watchful eye externally to observe what transpired within. During one of their night watches, Mary's concerned mother and grandmother unexpectedly arrived at the front door of Kelly's small apartment, seeking any clues about the young woman's worrisome vanishing. Upon entering, they scanned the sparsely furnished living space, but found no indications of her presence or anything amiss, though Levi promptly ushered them away from inspecting the solitary back bedroom, heightening their suspicions. Frustrated by the police department's apparent lack of urgency, Mary's loved ones persistently petitioned the authorities to reconsider reopening the case. At the same time, Kelly and Levi had submitted a statement accusing her relatives of stalking and tormenting them, claiming the unwarranted intrusions left them feeling unsafe and on edge. The shocking allegations only solidified Mary's family's belief that the pair were hiding crucial details. Repeatedly, her mother petitioned the detectives to review the security footage of the apartment complex's cameras hoping it would verify her last known whereabouts, but they refused without a search warrant and said there was insufficient cause for concern. Thus, the recordings remained out of reach. The grandmother informed the investigators that Levi had prevented her from entering the farthest room, implying they were likely concealing something inside. Nevertheless, the police dismissed her theory. In their determination to find answers, Mary's loved ones continued closely monitoring her so-called friend's activities. They met the guards, and they heard about the girl's disappearance, sympathized with their problem, and allowed the grandmother to watch the CCTV, the CCTV footage. But it turned out that the footage had already been erased because so much time had passed. If the police had promptly sought records, as requested by Mary's family after her disappearance, they could still be accessed, enabling them to determine whether Mary left the house. Unfortunately, this crucial opportunity to search for the girl was missed due to the police's lackadaisical approach to the case. On April 3rd, the police finally issued a missing person alert for Mary, even though every hour counted. This delay was a result of the police's negligent handling of the situation. On the same day, the police conducted a search in the friend's apartment, believing enough time had passed. However, the search yielded nothing. Despite a thorough examination of the entire apartment, including the farthest room, closets, and under the bed, Mary was not found, and nothing suspicious was detected. A breakthrough occurred the next day when one of Kelly and Levi's friends called the police, revealing a shocking story. He disclosed that Mary's body was still in the friend's apartment. Kelly, Levi, and their friend James had tied Mary up, taped her mouth in the bathroom, subjected her to beatings, and ultimately killed her. James confessed to a friend, who reported it to the police. The trio didn't know how to dispose of the body so James sought help from a Tinder date he had recently met. The four of them wrapped Mary's body in elastic bandages, layers of tape, and garbage bags. After treating it with household chemicals, they concealed the body in a mattress, adding spices to mask the smell. 
In response to the alarming call, the police conducted another search in the friend's apartment, discovering Mary's body in the same mattress they had lifted before. It remains unclear how the police missed the body during the initial search, as they claimed it was carefully hidden and unnoticed. Mary's body was found in a horrific state, with signs of brutal beatings and 133 knife wounds across her body. Most injuries were concentrated on her face, head, and back, and her hands bore numerous wounds from resisting. The forensic pathologist couldn't determine the exact day and time of death due to the early stage of body decomposition, intensifying the anguish for Mary's loved ones. The cause of death was multiple stab wounds, with many being minor and superficial, suggesting the friends derived pleasure from tormenting Mary. Levi posted a disturbing tweet on April 4, 2020, the day Mary's body was found, featuring a cartoon chick with a knife. It appeared to be a perverse expression of pride in their actions. The trio of friends VJ Levi, James, and Kelly VJ was arrested. Investigators discovered documents and Mary's bank card concealed among papers in their apartment. Numerous messages sent by Kelly and Levi to Mary since December 19, 2019, were also uncovered. Mary thought that being mocked for her illness was normal behavior. Kelly continued harassing the deceased woman, claiming the insults were jokes. However, Kelly's criminal record showed a history of violent behavior. James had been in and out of jail for years on drug and theft charges. He'd served brief stints behind bars, but kept reoffending. Levi, meanwhile, had no criminal past at all. The friends faced life imprisonment for kidnapping and murdering Mary. The accomplice who helped conceal the body fled across state lines. Located in Colorado, she was detained on charges of complicity. Her attorney argued she only assisted under threat from Kelly. As the ringleader, Kelly issued orders that all had to obey. Released on bail, the accomplice awaits trial unlike the imprisoned trio. Repeated delays from pandemic restrictions prolonged the legal proceedings. While James and Levi pleaded not guilty, the cases against them continue. Kelly admitted culpability and received a 32-year sentence. Thank you for following my channel. Remember to like and comment this video. Hi there, this is Drake. Today we shall acquaint ourselves with a perplexing case that demands unwavering nerves and will be evaluated with great ambiguity. I leave the conclusions to you, but let us delve directly into the matter at hand. Lacey Fletcher was born on November 25, 1985, to her parents Clay and Sheila Fletcher. She was the only child in a family residing in a small village in the state of Louisiana. This village had no more than 1,000 inhabitants, and its name translates to slaughter, which is quite fitting for the theme of today's story. When Lacey was around nine years old, she moved with her parents to a new home located in a well-to-do residential area on Slater Street. This street culminated in a cul-de-sac with grand houses and beautiful gardens. From an outsider's perspective, it seemed that the world there was much more beautiful, and life must have been happier than elsewhere. The Fletcher family appeared to be a typical middle-class family. Lacey's mother, Sheila, worked as a secretary in the court. Her responsibilities included overseeing all administrative procedures in the court. Lacey's father, Clay, worked for a non-profit organization. The family was devout, attending church every Sunday. Lacey attended a Baptist academy and played on the volleyball team there. Neighbors said that Lacey was no different from other children. She was cheerful, active, and enjoyed socializing with other kids. She appeared as a petite, well-coordinated girl who loved engaging in sports in the garden or running along the street. However, when she was 14 years old, her parents withdrew her from school, and she continued her education at home. By that time, signs of Asperger's syndrome had begun to manifest in Lacey, albeit subtly. And to the untrained eye, Asperger's syndrome is a form of autism characterized by pronounced impairments in social communication and interaction. The intellectual development of those affected is nearly the same as that of a healthy individual. So it is not entirely clear why Lacey was withdrawn from school and placed under homeschooling. Her parents never made any specific statements publicly regarding this matter. Perhaps it was somehow related to Asperger's syndrome and social disorders, but neither the neighbors nor the children noticed anything unusual in Lacey's behavior. A friend and classmate of Lacey later said that they became friends immediately when Lacey was attending school 
and described her as a very close and dear person. She mentioned that Lacey was often reserved and shy, but at the same time, she could express her opinion clearly in various situations. After Lacey stopped attending school at the age of 14, the connection between the friends was severed, and her classmate hardly heard anything about Lacey anymore. However, on one occasion, she cannot remember who told her, she learned that Lacey regularly visited psychologists during her teenage years, which was somewhat unusual at the time, as most visits to psychologists occurred for serious reasons. A neighbor of the Fletcher family named Robert said in 2022 that he saw Lacey about 15 years ago, when she was just over 20. At that time, the grown-up girl occasionally spent time with his younger brother, as their homes were adjacent. Even then, Robert noticed that she was different from people her age. She simply had different interests. While other girls went to parties, consumed alcohol, or were interested in boys, Lacey preferred to watch Disney movies alone. Overall, after the age of 14, the girl seemed more withdrawn. She ventured outside less and less, stopped attending school, and had almost no friends left. After Lacey essentially stopped communicating with this neighbor's brother, and she was no longer seen, everyone assumed that either the family had moved somewhere else, or Lacey had been sent to study elsewhere. But that was not the case. If someone had known that Lacey had been living in her parents' home all those years, it might have been possible to save her. In May 2017, Robert met with Lacey's father and inquired about the girl's fate, wanting to know how she was doing, if she had moved somewhere, and how her life was unfolding, where she was studying and what she was studying. But Lacey's father replied that she was fine and still living at home, then quickly changed the subject. This already seemed strange to the neighbor because at that time, the girl should have been in her early 30s and living nearby, even without delving into someone else's life, there was still the opportunity to see how those who lived nearby took out the trash or came and went somewhere. However, no one had seen Lacey all those years and this strange evasion from her father and the neighbor's suspicion remained with him. January 2022, 2.30 a.m., a call was made to the local police station. It was Lacey's mother, Sheila Fletcher, her voice filled with distress, reporting that her daughter had stopped breathing. The police immediately rushed to their home to provide assistance. At the same time, the coroner's office was notified. When the authorities entered the house, they were hit by a repugnant odor, a stench of decay and feces that made it unbearable to breathe the air inside. Later, the coroner would say that throughout his professional career, he had never encountered anything more horrifying than this smell, and for a week, he could not eat properly due to nausea. This man, who had worked as a doctor and coroner for 30 years, had seen various accidents and unfortunate incidents, but what he witnessed in the Fletcher's home shocked and horrified him. The sheriff of the police was also completely bewildered, looking at the scene in the living room where Lacey lay on the couch. At first glance, one could tell that she was around 30 years old, but her appearance was unkempt. That was the initial impression. Upon closer inspection, it was discovered that Lacey weighed only 96 pounds, severely emaciated. She wore only a t-shirt, which was pulled up above her chest. Her eyes were wide open and her hair was completely tangled, resembling a dense woven mat that somehow ended up on her head. And it was impossible to comb her hair. Her entire body was covered in feces, even in her ears, and waste material was found in her eyes and mouth. Bed sores were found all over her body, some of them festering, and some were so deep that they reached the bones. Bed sores typically occur in those who are bedridden due to illness. Lacey's body was marked with brown spots and bed sores, and her buttocks were completely deformed with patches of missing skin. Lacey was infested with insect larvae that lived in various parts of her body, causing unimaginable suffering. The photos taken at that time were never published in the media or on the internet, as they were simply too horrifying and could be traumatizing for people. Even the coroner and the police officers who arrived on the scene had a hard time recovering from what they saw. However, there is a publicly available photograph of the couch on which Lacey died. This piece of furniture was completely destroyed, rotted away, and where Lacey lay, a huge hole formed. 
in which human remains, pieces of skin, pus, and feces were discovered. Even the wooden floor beneath the couch was covered in all of this and began to rot. During the autopsy, the coroner found remnants of foam from the couch upholstery in Lacey's stomach. Apparently, she was so hungry that she began to eat the couch. The cause of Lacey's death was multifactorial, meaning that her death resulted from a combination of many factors, including the neglected bed sores that required urgent treatment as well as bone inflammation and blood infection. When Lacey was found, her mother Sheila was sitting with her on the couch, crying, and her father Clay looked utterly devastated. Naturally, the investigators had numerous questions about how a person could end up in such a condition. When did neglect begin, and why did the parents who lived in Lacey's home do nothing and allow things to escalate to such an extent? Initially, the girl's parents did not want to publicly comment on the matter. Later. Her mother testified that Lacey had been growing more and more distant from them, and when she turned 20, she simply refused to leave the house. She had no interests. At some point, Lacey refused to get up from the couch, prompting her parents to seek medical help. However, they consulted a doctor without Lacey present, as she refused to leave the house. This doctor advised them to take the girl to the hospital, but Lacey did not want to go anywhere, and her parents did not know what to do next. Her condition worsened, and at some point, Lacey even stopped getting up to use the bathroom. She began relieving herself in a towel that her mother placed near the couch, and sometimes it happened right in bed. The girl silently and aloofly lay on soiled bedding. Lacey's mother mentioned that she constantly brought her daughter food and drinks and tried to tend to her wounds, which resulted from her constant lying on the couch. Lacey never complained of pain and remained in her right mind until the end. When Lacey suddenly stopped breathing, her mother called emergency services, but it was already too late. There were rumors that it was a neighbor who compelled Lacey's parents to make the call. This neighbor saw Lacey lying motionless through a window and realized that something was amiss. He told Lacey's mother to make the call or else he would do it himself. However, the police did not confirm this information later but as it is known, rumors do not arise out of thin air. They stem from a lack of information. It later became known that Lacey's parents were not at home at all in the days leading up to her death, nearly two days. And during those days, their daughter remained hungry. Of course, it is possible that her mother placed some food on the couch, but still no one cared for her during those days. The question arises, why didn't Lacey get up from the couch? And why didn't she help herself to something to eat considering she was in her right mind? Some sources suggest that the girl suffered from locked-in syndrome, in which a person is fully conscious but almost completely paralyzed physically. Among other causes, this condition is due to damage to the brain. Overall, Lacey lived exclusively on that couch for over 12 years without getting up. In court, the jury members required medical assistance to make sense of the photographs of Lacey's body. When these photos were shown, complete silence filled the courtroom. Everyone present was simply shocked and could not believe what they saw. On May 2, 2022, Clay and Sheila Fletcher were charged with second-degree murder and initially sent to the East Feliciana prison. The parents repeatedly claimed their innocence and emphasized that their daughter Lacey was in her right mind until the end and could make her own decisions. On May 4, the Fletchers were released on a $300,000 bond. The legal process did not end there. They were tried in February 2023, but it is inconceivable to imagine that parents left their daughter to decompose alive on a couch, doing nothing and taking no action. They even watched television together in the same room in the evenings. That is, the couch on which Lacey lay was in the family's living room. And in the evenings, the parents watched movies while their daughter lay nearby in such a state. It is simply unthinkable, as the stench of feces and decay permeated the entire house and was unbearable. And yet the parents continued to live there and lead a normal life. Lacey looked unwell and her parents continued to behave as if nothing was wrong. There are other horrifying details that have not been made public. People familiar with this story still wonder how such a thing could happen. Was it a cunning process that lasted for 12 years, with Lacey once lying down on the couch? 
and her condition gradually deteriorated more and more. Of course, her bed sores did not appear yesterday or today. They developed over a prolonged period of time. And let's assume that someone's child declares that they will no longer go to the bathroom. How can one let that go unchecked and dismiss it? And even if Lacey was an adult, there must have been a way to place her in some institution, at the very least, where she could receive help, even if it was forced. Of course, this requires significant financial investment, and it is hard to believe that Lacey's parents did not have the means for such medical care. They had steady jobs and earned a decent income. They had a large house in a good residential area, and it seems they were not drowning in debt as they quickly raised $300,000 for their bail. It is difficult to believe that the parents could not find the means to provide psychological assistance to their daughter. It appears that the girl refused treatment in her early teenage years. But why, and at what point did everything come to a halt? No one can say what was going on in the minds of Lacey's parents or in her own mind. But the fact remains that a healthy person would not willingly spend their life on a couch. That much is clear. Something must have happened in Lacey's mind, and it was difficult or impossible for her parents to reach her. Or perhaps they simply did not want to deal with her. Lacey's parents were initially charged with involuntary manslaughter, but ultimately, the charge was replaced with second-degree murder. Later, the Fletchers, who had been released on bail, were arrested again on June 19th, and a grand jury once again indicted them for murder, according to the district attorney's office. We will ensure justice for Lacey, and the public will know that guardians will be held accountable for negligence or cruel treatment of a person under their care, the prosecutor's statement said. Thank you for watching. I recommend watching other videos on our channel. Like and subscribe to my channel. Until we meet again. Hey there, dear friends, it's Drake again on Crime Story Diaries. Darlene Gentry captivated onlookers along with her radiant beauty. She possessed flowing golden locks and a beaming smile extending from ear to ear. Throughout her schooling years, she reigned as prom queen oftentimes affectionately dubbed Barbie by many an admirer. Gregarious Darlene took center stage under the spotlight, attracting crowds of suitors. Upon matriculation, she matriculated at Texas State Technical College aspiring to become a dental assistant. There, fate introduced her to Keith, a drafting and welding student, and their connection sparked instantly. Considered the most striking couple on campus, their romance blossomed quickly. After earning her degree, Darlene anticipated a marriage proposal from her beloved Keith, but he wasn't prepared to wed just yet, leading to their split. Darlene migrated to Dallas to work for a dentist, though a misfortune involving her pilfered automobile prompted her return to Keith's town. Throughout this fluctuating time, Keith remained deeply attached to her and mourned her absence. Upon discovering Darlene's return, he eagerly arrived to see her and proposed resuscitating their relationship. She agreed without hesitation, as her feelings for him had endured. In 1999, Keith dropped to one knee and asked for her hand in marriage, which she joyfully accepted. Before long, they welcomed three sons into the world. Despite the considerable challenges of rearing three young boys, Darlene maintained her excellent figure, cared for herself diligently, and found pleasure in shopping excursions. Keith's stable income allowed them a comfortable lifestyle in a lovely neighborhood near his parents. Growing disenchanted with her career as a dental assistant, Darlene accepted a part-time position as a school nurse. Frequently away on work trips, Keith recognized the difficulties Darlene faced daily and searched tirelessly for a role closer to home to spend more quality time with his family. However, this new opportunity provided less financial security, and Darlene's spending habits, fueled by accumulating credit card debt, led them towards a precarious financial situation. Keith repeatedly advised prudence with finances until he found a higher-paying job. But his words seemed to fall on deaf ears, as she either didn't listen or didn't want to amend her ways. Financial troubles had long caused quarrels between husband and wife. On the morning of November 5th, 2005, 
31-year-old Darlene Gentry dialed 911 in distress, telling the operator that intruders had invaded her home and shot her spouse Keith while he slept. She stated finding him on their bed with a gunshot wound to the head and recounted how the thieves forced entry, stolen their firearm and made escape in the night. Emergency services rushed to the scene with haste, but upon arrival noticed no signs of a break-in. Further, Keith's gun safe sat unlocked by key, with windows and doors still intact. During the panic-stricken call to first responders, Darlene neglected administering first aid to Keith who clung to life, grievously injured but breathing still. Neighbors looked on in horror as paramedics raced the devoted father of three children to the nearest hospital, fighting to preserve his future with his family. Detectives took note of inconsistencies in Darlene's narrative compared to the undisturbed state of the property, raising doubts about the supposed burglary gone wrong. The revolver laid neatly beside the residence on the avenue caught the investigators' attention. This scene differed vastly from the typical burglary. The law enforcement officials sensed that something was amiss. Forensic analysis was ordered on her hands for gunshot residue, and Darlene was summoned to the station house for an interview to which she obliged. During the interrogation, Darlene recounted that the night prior, she and companions had gone out. Upon returning home at half past eight, she and her spouse exchanged heated words concerning credit card debts. Darlene exited to decompress, then came back inside, and they reconciled their differences. The young ones fell ill, so she bedded down with them in the nursery, while Keith slept solo in the master bedroom. Darlene awoke freezing, disturbing her she rose to investigate and found their back door ajar. Keith's firearms haven lay vacant. Upon entering their chamber, she saw her husband face down, his mouth foaming and head hemorrhaging. She instantly summoned emergency services. Investigators found peculiar her lack of effort to assist, despite her medical knowledge. Even lay people typically try aiding, especially with the operator's guidance. Throughout the call, Darlene spoke placidly, as if oblivious, initiating with backdrop, peaking suspicion. When questioned regarding this, Darlene replied she was stunned and unsure how to proceed, primarily preoccupied with the children's well-being. At the dusty police station, she neglected to inquire about her husband's worrisome condition. During the prolonged interrogation, the stoic police officers informed Darlene that Keith's brain had ceased functioning. They ushered her to the bleak hospital room where with a heaviness in her heart, she consented to disconnecting her husband from the life-sustaining machines. Police had observed Darlene's peculiar and detached behavior throughout the distressing ordeal and noted her lack of tears or visible display of sorrow. On that very same day, as the interrogation relentlessly continued, the detectives pressed Darlene with probing questions, desperately hoping she would break down and confess to the heinous crime. Realizing this was futile, she prudently invoked her Fifth Amendment right to remain silent and her Sixth Amendment right to legal counsel. The police immediately halted the barrage of questioning, released Darlene from their custody, and she promptly hired a skilled defense attorney to represent her. The police compiled a list of the deceased's possessions, noticeably his father's gift of a small caliber pistol now missing. Ballistics matched the bullet removed from Keith to his father's former .22. At the request of authorities, Darlene permitted a search of her dwelling, where latex gloves and a fired casing were found amidst the kitchen garbage. Analysis of the gloves revealed gunpowder and DNA from both Darlene and Keith, while her fingerprints surfaced on the handgun. Previous samples from Darlene also exhibited traces of powder. It emerged that Keith held an insurance policy worth somewhat under $8,000, presenting a rationale for foul play as financial difficulties pressed upon Darlene. Nineteen sons later, Darlene was charged with homicide. Apprehended, she was transported to a penitentiary, though her inmate status proved ephemeral. Numerous found it implausible she committed the deed, such as Keith's parents, who maintained their care of Darlene and the children in the family abode after the incident. The bail was graciously paid, affording Darlene's transient freedom she fled back to the home of Keith's parents to evade the scrutinizing investigators. Their frequent interrogations had become bothersome, prompting her shouts to shoo them away. Fleeing further, 
Darlene left her children in the capable care of Keith's parents as she sought sanctuary with one of Keith's sisters, hoping to escape the persistent police presence. Meanwhile, the inquiring investigators delved deeply into Darlene and Keith's relationship, revealing Keith's passionate fondness for his familial bonds. Desiring to spend more quality time with his loved ones, he reluctantly abandoned his financially rewarding job for a less remunerative and emotionally taxing position. He worried that his wife neglected her maternal duties, constantly dumping the responsibility onto Keith's nearby parents. Separately, Darlene indulged her tastes for shopping and beauty treatments in her spare moments. Despite this, Keith would insist to his parents that, I will never abandon Darlene. My love for her runs too deep. She is the one who would have to leave me. Keith's brother recalled that she was seldom content, unwilling to stay home and bond with the family. My sibling wanted to spend more quality time with our family and she did not. He wanted to be there to bathe and tuck the kids into bed each night. He was like the ideal father. He played football in the yard and played with the children and they were overjoyed. Despite the police's diligent efforts to investigate the case, no other plausible suspects emerged. Keith was a good man with no rivals or enemies. No one wished him any misfortune. Despite being under suspicion and cognizant that the police knew about the life insurance, Darlene did not pursue a payout from the insurance company. She was confident that she would be acquitted in the court of law. She was a lovely young woman who did not fit the profile of a criminal. The prosecution only had circumstantial evidence and assumptions to rely on. Darlene grew weary of living with Keith's relatives, so she contacted a friend who was a real estate agent. He knew about the tragedy that had befallen their family and was surprised when she reached out to him. Even more surprising was Darlene's request to demolish her house, claiming it held only painful memories. The real estate agent explained that raising such a beautiful house was not a good idea and suggested she consider relocating instead. He offered her a nice parcel of land near a pond, an idea she initially liked, mentioning that Keith had always dreamed of owning a family home by the pond where the boys could go fishing. A week had passed when Darlene contacted the agent with a peculiar proposition to fill their neighborhood pond. Suspicions arose for the man representing the property, prompting a report to local law enforcement. Detectives found Darlene's request to fill the watering hole rather odd and speculated that perhaps she discarded the firearm within its murky depths and now aimed to permanently conceal evidence. Using sophisticated sonar equipment, a dive squad rapidly located the submerged gun just 15 minutes into the search, unknown to the woman. Eager to apprehend the culprit, police recruited the real estate agent to assist in their trap. He informed Darlene that drainage of the pond was necessary before any filling could commence. Anxious, she probed for information on the draining timeline. The agent responded that the process would kick off in two days' time. In the meantime, two undercover officers hunkered down amidst bordering bushes, camera poised to capture the unfolding drama. Worried the pistol would be found, Darlene anxiously trekked to the pond near dusk. Footage from a security camera revealed her wandering the trails in faded denim and tall rubber boots, furtively peering this way and that to ensure no onlookers witnessed her endeavor. She trudged into the murky water and forged straight toward where the gun had been located. For several minutes she rummaged through the vegetation, desperately seeking the gun yet naturally finding naught. Frustrated, she splashed ashore and drove off in vexation. Throughout the trial, prosecutors zeroed in on her actions following Keith's demise, parading all circumstantial evidence and proof against her. The state argued Darlene committed the heinous act to finance her profligate purchases and luxurious lifestyle realizing a lifeless husband was more profitable than a living one. With his sizable $750,000 life insurance policy appearing to solve all her debt-ridden problems, Darlene maintained her innocence. Once the video of Darlene scouring for the weapon in the pond surfaced in court, she clarified that rumors swirled of the real perpetrator planting the firearm there to frame her, compelling her to retrieve it first and avoid being falsely accused by investigators. Darlene filed a motion to preclude this video from the proceedings, but it was denied. After hours of tense deliberation, 
the jury unanimously ruled her culpable. She was sentenced to six decades in prison with a chance for parole in 2037. Keith's anguished parents attained custody of their three bereaved grandchildren. As per the court's judgment, Darlene is forbidden from contacting the children. Currently 47, Darlene Gentry still asserts her innocence from behind bars. Multiple appeals lodged by her legal team have been rejected. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video informative. Please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel for more insightful true crime cases.